Hello, and welcome to this webinar where we will explore the role of low-code platforms for organizations that build complex applications. It's clear that low-code technologies have been disrupting IT for a few years already, and there are a lot of players, and that trend is only accelerating. But that's not the point of this webinar today. Today we seek to understand if low-code has a role for complex applications and the organizations that depend on them. Perhaps we should quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Sean from the product team at Servoy, and I'm going to take you through some of the questions surrounding this topic. I'm also joined by my colleague Tuan, and he's a technical expert who can actually show some examples of the concepts that we'll present. I think it makes sense to quickly look at what kinds of applications are traditionally created by low-code platforms. Let's start with the long-standing business problem. Most core software systems have functionality gaps, and those gaps have long been filled by end users, creating a kind of shadow IT, which includes spreadsheets, documents, and informal processes. Low-code addresses this problem by empowering the users as so-called citizen developers to formalize these processes and create efficiencies within the organization. Typically, this results in small, fit-for-purpose applications that serve users who are internal to the company or a single department. The business processes are often transactional in nature, for example, searching for status updates on records or submitting classic form updates, such as a service order request or an approval workflow. And low-codes have dramatically accelerated delivery of these apps by providing ease of development, low-touch DevOps, and governance. While low-code platforms are used to fill the gaps in core systems, they are not typically used to build the core systems themselves. These functions are commonly served by off-the-shelf products, bespoke software, and in-house IT departments. These systems broker many business functions in parallel, and they connect stakeholders from different departments as well as end customers or users. As a result, users are more empowered to manage a variety of concurrent business processes. So the bar is much higher when building complex applications. In order for low-codes to deliver the required tooling, they need to address a few key areas where full-stack development has always dominated. Most low-codes provide various configurable UI templates and builders to create pages, but you can only bend a template so far. App builders want total freedom to create custom user experiences. Business logic can also be a challenge. Often, low-codes provide a kind of visual process modeling, which can connect events, but the heavy lifting is usually done by extending the platform. Often, this falls on the shoulders of a full-stack developer. When it comes to integrations, the better low-codes will provide pre-built connectors, supporting popular databases and cloud services. But real-world applications often connect to legacy or proprietary systems, non-standard data sources, and protocols. Low-codes will struggle here. Finally, software vendors and some enterprise applications have a whole list of requirements beyond the scope of what many low-codes can deliver, and we'll get into that. But let's dig into the UX freedom before seeing a few demos. Many low-code platforms provide a kind of website builder with only simple navigation between single pages. A low-code for complex applications should be able to provide navigation which is very contextual and personalized, and facilitates the user as they traverse a variety of data, often completing multiple tasks in parallel. A truly dynamic UX follows and responds to a user's actions. Be sure that your UI builder provides a robust event model for all components, such as focus, gain, and loss, and data changes, and right clicks and double clicks and more. Most low codes will talk to one or more data sources and provide some degree of read-write capabilities. However, the users of business critical applications expect a kind of mashup experience where they may have a single view of data from a variety of sources. Users expect to search, filter, and analyze the data before them and visualize more complex relationships as they take action. Your application builder should also allow you to easily blend data from many sources into a single view and navigate complex relationships. There is perhaps no more essential component in the business application arsenal than the grid. Every low-code platform will allow some form of grid views. However, complex applications should empower users to go to the next level, allowing them to use grids for deep analysis and to take action in the context of individual rows or cells. Business users expect dynamic interactive content and the ability to edit directly in grids with all the events and hooks to process validation and downstream business logic. Of course, the performance must be snappy and users expect 
that their personal grid preferences will be remembered automatically. A more powerful grid experience should allow the user to freely explore data, searching and filtering with ease. Hierarchical data should be easily represented and users should be free to explore group configurations and to drill into the results. And summarized or aggregate values should be dynamically calculated on the fly. Of course, power users will want to take it to the next level and analyze data in a pivot table. Taken all together, it's a tall order, and many low-code platforms come up well short of enabling the great UX which is demanded by the users of business-critical applications. Let's take a look at some examples of better UX from a low-code platform. So, Duan, do you think that you can show some demonstrations of how to build great UX using a low-code platform? Sure, Sean, I can certainly do that. Here, we're looking at an application created using the Servoid platform. I can cover some of the points you brought up by creating a new screen. Let's first log in. In order to add a new screen, I'm gonna to switch to the Servoid developer. Let's add a new screen. And this new screen is gonna use, it's gonna bind with a uh, database table called orders. So I'm gonna give it the title orders. And here's a little grid. I'm gonna add a few of the fields to, to view data from. Let's just add a few here. All right. And now let's take a look. So here's the order screen that I just added. And here you go. Okay. And, and you said that this is showing data that came from a database table. Is that right? Yes. It's bound, it's currently, bound the yep. It's currently hooked up to a Postgres SQL database, but we can really hook up any relational database or even a flat file. Okay. How about a web service? Yes, that's also okay. really possible. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that you have like the, the order ID and, and the, the customer uh, looks like a customer ID code and the, the employee is like an integer ID. Um, is there any way you can, I guess those are foreign keys or, or something. Is there any way you can actually turn those into human readable values? Yeah, that's a great catch. Yes, there are foreign keys to uh, a related table. Um, let's try to do that. So the way to do that in this platform is we'll have to create and set up a relationship. Now, I've already made the relationship, but let's take a look at what they look like. Here we have orders to customers. Um, as mentioned, the customer ID is the foreign key and the link between the two tables. Um, given that we have the relationship, let's try to connect the two together. Here we have it, orders to customers. And I think what we'll wanna show here is the company name. The same goes uh, to the employee ID. We'll use orders to employees. And in this case, let's use the first name. And now, we should have um, the updated values. Okay, so it's able to it's able to bring data from other tables and show them in the same grid in the same form here. That's right. All right. Um, uh, are you able to um, are you able to sort uh, on the columns, especially the columns that came from a another table? Yeah. Does that not I, work? I can certainly do that. Um, Now, in order to do that, I think what we'll have to do is add a header title as well, just to make it clear what we're sorting on. 
I'll put customer here and I'll put employee here. And now if I want to sort, I can sort by customer or, or employee as well. So okay. And so these it's, are, able to, it's able to join the data and, and do the sort. That's right. Now um, can you scroll down in the grid? I, I guess it's just sorting with whatever's with, with what's in the grid. If you scroll down in the grid, does it get go to the end of your database or just the end of what's cached in your component? Oh, yes, at like some point it will reach the end, but uh, it's currently cached the first couple hundred records. But as you're scrolling, you can see that it's paging and, and, and pulling in more data direct from the database table. Okay, so you don't have to you don't have to code in and like pagination or or some event to fetch more data. It just does it for you. Yes, it's done automatically by this grid component and the binding. To that That's part of your data binding. Okay. Are you are you able then to uh, search on? Uh, I see you have like a search field and a filter. Are you able to to do some searching? Yeah, I can. Um, in order to get the search to work, I need to mention. Um, which fields are searchable. Let me do that first. So I just need to put in the filter type per column. And since these are all uh, var cars or strings, I can use filter types text, except for this one. This one looks like it's a date. So I'll use date here. I'm gonna restart the client now in order for this to work. Okay, now that I've hooked up the search um, filters, I can start searching. Let's uh, search for one of the customers in this list. Vince. And there you have it. So it's able to search on a string fragment and it's able to search on the data that you join in from another table. What, what if you, can you also do another word or anything like that or is it just- Yeah, we can. Say we wanted to search not only on the customer, but maybe on a specific employee, we can also put his name here and I'll narrow down okay, the wow. further. Um, the, the other field we added the search on to was the order date. We can actually apply a filter to that field as well. Maybe we wanna look up any of the orders um, from this year only. And here you have it just from 2021. On top of that, we could even apply another search. So say you already had a filter for the year 2021, you can also look up customers and employees on top of that. Okay, so you can, you can combine searching and filtering, like you can leave the filter on and then the search works within the, the filter. Yes. Now, now that, that's pretty, the, I like that search, that's pretty powerful. Um, but how, how does like, this is a example database you have. I work with a lot of customers that have really big Oracle or SQL server databases, half, half a million records at least. Um, is, is, is this type of form able to handle a, a large backend or is there some limitation? Yes, it can handle very large databases. Okay, uh, suppose that, um, you were able to, to see a, a lot of records here. I also work with um, folks who build applications where the end users need to do some kind of analysis. Uh, are you able to show hierarchical data here the way, the way we discussed in the, some of the slides where you could do some grouping or some um, drill down? Yeah, we can certainly do some of that. Um, what I can do is add a few more fields that way we can uh, show grouping and show how that might be possible. Let me switch over to my developer. Let's add a few more fields here. So 
maybe we pick the city, country, and address just to start out with. I'll just add the filter type in addition to that. Okay. I'm just gonna rerun the client now. Okay, now I've added uh, three new fields, the city, country, and address for the shipment. I can group via the country. So that gets the data um, grouped by country. And I can also group it by customer after that even. So now if I were to look at a country like Argentina, I can see all the orders specific to that country and grouped by customers. Very cool. And that works with all the records that, that are in the database. It's uh, also not just happening um, in the browser, but really if you were connected to a large table, it works the same way? Yes, yep. Well, that's, that's pretty powerful. Now, um, I think a lot of users would expect that if they set up a, a grid like this uh, and then um, they log out and log back in or they came and signed in from a different device that they could get the same configuration that they had. Are you able to remember things about what the user is doing and make a more personalized experience? Yep. The way this application set up, we already remember the settings. Let me log out and log back in to prove that. Here we're back at orders, and you can see it's already grouped by country and customer. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to say you've you've um, been able to demonstrate some of the the items that we discussed about, um, you know, the kind of user experience that more complicated applications require, and you've been able to recreate that with a low code platform. But do you mind if I? Uh, if I come back to you in a few minutes and ask for some more demos, I'm gonna go over a couple other topics. Absolutely, I'll be here. Thanks. We just saw on the last demo that my colleague was able to connect to a database, but also that his tool created an abstraction layer, providing the same experience for any database, web service, or flat file. Taking it a step further, a low code for complex apps should provide sophisticated business objects, which not only give better UX, but also bind directly to those connected data sources. App builders must be able to quickly model relationships between data sources, create data-driven lists, and calculate derived values and aggregates. Moreover, a robust low-code platform will provide a rich layer of events for both the UI, but also data interactions. This provides the hooks for app builders to implement that intricate logic. Finally, we're talking low code here, not no code. And when the time comes to handle that logic, most low codes do two things wrong. First, they quickly need to escape to low level language to provide a plugin, or they implement some kind of proprietary macro language. A better low code must provide a productive yet robust way to implement custom logic. This is very rare in the world of low codes. Again, I'll ask my colleague for some help to show what's possible. Okay, Duan, we're back to see some more demonstrations. This time I'm hoping you could show me a bit more about um, some of that data binding and uh, complexity is related to business logic and how someone might go about coding things and in a low code platform. Uh, do you think you can take us through a few scenarios? Hey, Sean, sure, I can totally do that. Um, while you're going over your PowerPoint slides, I've made a small detail screen with additional information regarding the orders table. Why don't we take a look at that first? So here's uh, more information about the order. And you can see here that we've, we have information about the employee, the order date, required date, um, 
a lot of other fields that were on that table. And we also include the order lines or the order details of a particular order. Okay, so if I look at the screen right, I'm seeing information from a few data sources merged together. I see customer information, I see employee information, and I see like child records of what would be order lines or order details. And you've, you've pulled those together. Can you tell me a bit about, about those fields that have a, looks like a drop down arrow on them? Yeah, for sure. Um, these are certainly drop downs, and um, I think they're called combo boxes uh, in certain platforms. But yeah, we can obviously see that it looks at multiple employees. Same for the ship via options. Um, why don't we look at the developer and see how that's done? Okay. So here, like I mentioned, I made another detail screen um, to combine with the order screen. So let's look at that. So here's the employee field. And you can see that it does indeed connect to the employee ID. And what I'm using to show the list is uh, a value list. So this is a data uh, business object in this platform. Let's take a look at that value list. And here we can see that it's connected to a specific table, the employees, and we're showing first and last name, but returning the uh, foreign key or the the main primary key employee ID that connects the foreign key in the orders table. And that's how we're able to highlight, uh, you know, show that drop down. Okay, so it's, it's writing back the ID, but it will show both the first name and the last name together. Correct. Okay, I have to ask that question again about, um, suppose you have a few thousand employees in that table, is that, is that a problem? No, no problem at all. Um, because it's a combo box or type ahead, you can actually start searching and it'll, it'll query and narrow it down. So it won't actually query all of your records. It will just kind of page as well. Okay. So, but that's, that's not a code thing. That's more of this data binding. Yep. It's done automatically for you. Cool. Could you maybe show uh, how you got those order lines um, to, to come up on the form uh, in a, like a parent child kind of relationship? Yep. Here, um, I had to create another table view, and that's the orders detail table. So as you can see, here's a grid. And in this case, it's connected to the orders detail data source. So all of these fields uh, belong to that data source. And to connect the two, I know that there is a relationship um, orders to orders detail. Right, so the relationship is tied um, to the order ID field. So, so in order to connect the two, I use a form component, a tab form component. I've attached the form and I've attached the relationship that ties them together. And once I do that, the rest is done automatically for me. So when, when you, if you were to go out to your grid and pick a different record, it'll automatically load in the right order record, but also all the right order lines for a different record. That's and correct. It, you, you don't have to have some event that you trap and tell it to load or, or anything like that? Yep, there's no extra code needed for any of that. Okay. Um, uh, could you show us back in the, the running client, you had also in the grid, it looked like you could edit um, the contents of the order or those order lines. Yeah, let's try doing that. Let's maybe add a few more quesos to our order. I see you have the total is, is going up as you change the, the quantity. Is that um, some code you run when you click the button or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great catch. Uh, this is a subtotal per line item um, and it is not an actual field in the database table, rather a calculated field. So it's, yep, it's calculating on the fly as I'm increasing or incre incrementing. And is that some sort of expression builder or code or how does, how does a user go about making a, a calculated field to show up on a form? Yeah, let's take a look. So here we go to the orders, uh, uh, orders detail table. Um, 
we can see the standard schema, but you can also look at the calculations that I've added. One is called subtotal. This is the one that's being used. Uh, by using a simple scripting language, JavaScript, we can create these small uh, calculated um, uh, fields. And so really it's just, you know, the quantity times unit price and the discount. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think in other low code platforms, it's common that you have some kind of um, expression um, mechanism to do dynamic uh, types of things on forms. But um, I don't know, it's, it doesn't seem very complex. Are, could you at least calculate the total of the entire order? So you got a few lines there. What, what does that look like? Do you have some way to, to go over a set of records or something like that? Yeah, that takes a little bit more effort, but why don't we show that? Um, so in order to do something like that, we'll have to put the calculations in the orders table. So I can create a calculated field to do that. Let's jump to the orders first and let's make it here. So let's call this the um, order total, or in this case, you know, the grand total. Let's make this a number. So here again, I'm, I'm going back to JavaScript uh, scripting code and I can just write out a small little method to do this. Uh, because I know that there is a relationship between um, the orders and the order detail, I can use the same business uh, relationship I have and am able to iterate through and get all the different order details for a particular order. And um, once I've done that, I can easily tally up the subtotal. And now let's return the total. And I think we let's add the freight cost as well. Juan, can I ask a question? Um, a couple questions, really. Uh, I see well, that you're writing JavaScript. Um, is this is this some kind of a browser framework like React or Angular or um, what kind of JavaScript developer do you need to be in order to to do this sort of thing? That's a great question, Sean. Um, this is actually server side uh, JavaScript. Um, we don't uh, in this you know scope we don't think about client side um, the DOM or anything like that. It's a pure scripting uh, language here. Okay, and I also noticed that as you were typing, you were getting a lot of auto completion. Um, for things like your for loop and, and even it's like it already knew about your data model because it was prompting, I think, those relations and, and, and the fields, um, like even that other calculation you made, it, it already knew about it. I also saw that there was like warnings that would coming up, like it was marking your code um, for sanity. Um, yes. is, that, yep. is that part of the, the platform or, or how does that work? Yes, it's certainly part of the platform and we extend the, uh, the basic scripting language with additional APIs and the business uh, objects that you see and that you've, you know, might have created at design time, such as the relationship. So even though you're writing code, it's more of like um, scripting than, than low level programming. That's right. And you have full control over it. So, yes. Okay. Well, I want to see this, this grand total uh, uh, in action. Yeah, let's make use of it. Um, I'm going to add it to the detail screen here. And I already have a, a label here, so let's make use of it. Um, and here we just have to hook up the data provider. And let's make this visible. All right, let's jump back to the browser. And there you have it, um, the grand total. Now, this grand total is, uh, is a calculation. So we can even, you know, we can increase the quantity and you can see as I'm increasing, it's also dynamically changing. Very cool. And so that gets, that gets fired. Uh, you don't have to, to tell it to do it. It just, it binds automatically to That's all the right. other data. 
Very cool. Uh, I I have a maybe a, a another question. Can you can you use that same calculation over like somewhere else maybe on your like is it just in this screen or could you use it back on your your grid view that you made earlier? Yeah. Once you have a calculation in place, um, anywhere you use the data source, and, and that means you know even on this screen you could make use of it. So why don't we add another column to show the grand total on this screen as well? Let's do that. And you can see that it's able to find the order total. Um, add a little header here. And maybe this time let's add a little bit of formatting as well just so the dollar amounts come through correctly. All right, let's take a look. There you have it. Grand total as a column on the grid. Okay, very cool. And and you got it to, to format the, uh, with the currency as well. Um, neat. Uh, sort of makes me think now that I'm back looking at this grid and that you had just showed um, those child records on the detail form. Uh, and I remember you were able to search on related data, like you were able to find records that were from a certain customer and a certain employee. Um, but those are I, like one-to-one -one type relationships. Uh, could you find records? Um, I'm just thinking of more complex data operations that I see in business applications. Could you find records like order records that had a certain child record um, like in the order details? Like, um, I don't know, maybe a product that was ordered or something like that. I'm thinking of a customer service rep who gets a phone call. They look up an order based on a product that was on the order and not just some, you know, standard grid view. Yeah, that's certainly a more uh, complex um, search. Uh, so say maybe I wanted to search you know, for a particular products such as, uh, you know, fried, fried me, um, how, how, how would I do that? Um, let's, um, let's certainly go through that. Um, in order to do that, something like that, I'd have to extend the, the basic search functionality of this uh, grid form. So let's jump back to the developer and see how that might be done. All right, now with every form, there is a scripting um, side to it. I'm gonna to jump to the scripting side of the orders table view. Um, and I'm gonna add some additional logic uh, to this form. I'm gonna override the on show event hook and I'm gonna add some additional code here um, to extend the search functionality. Now I know that there is a toolbar filter object um, in the underlying base hierarchy of this form. And I'm just gonna um, make use of it and extend it. Here, we're just getting the search object and I'm gonna add an additional search provider. Um, now, given that I know the relationships um, between the data sets, so orders, orders, detail, and maybe I wanna go all the way down to the products. Now, this is another relationship uh, that's kind of chained on top of the first, right? And from there, I might want to search for the product name. So now that I know all of that, let's hook that up. All right. Now that we've gotten all that hooked up, let's now search for a particular product uh, in an order. So maybe I start out with searching for... Um, a pro, uh, orders in a specific country, like say Germany. And maybe I want also only orders that have coffee as a line item. So that narrows it down to four. And if I jump into one of the detail, I can see that indeed coffee is there. Okay, so, so and that's coming from records in your database. So your your one line of code there that you put when the when the search runs goes and and is able to join orders to order details over to the product and then search on a string fragment because if you didn't type the whole thing in 
for coffee, but then at the same time also know that the country was Germany. That's right. Yeah, it's pretty okay. powerful. I, that, that's a check in the box for me, Juan, because that, that is, you know, more complex, uh, advanced type of data access. Um, could, would you mind showing the, the source code again for that? I had, I had one or two questions. Yeah, I can do that. So I see that um, you have these event handlers um, and you also mentioned about overriding. It, it seems like you're already starting with a, like um, a super class or a, a, a template or, or something that gives you already some of the UI and some logic there and you extend it. And I also think I see that you have like a lot of UI events. I see the cell double click above too, which is I guess how you get from the form that is the grid to the form that is the detail and you have a, a double click event there. Yeah, that's a great catch. Yes. Um, yep. The navigation is done with this method here. And uh, because in the uh, form itself, the grid itself has several event hooks and I've just tied that method to the on cell double click. And that's how we get to our navigation. Um, the on show is obviously another event hook on the form itself. And this is executed when the form is shown. Okay, very cool. No, I think I get it. Um, uh, I have to say uh, it's impressive, but uh, there's maybe one more thing you could show me that would convince me that you can do complex, um, more intricate logic with a, with a low code platform. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of what you're showing me is um, not really business logic, but more like coding around the workflow and, and data access and you showed data binding, but I'm thinking of um, a scenario where there's actually some heavy logic on the more like a backend thing, um, uh, like a bulk edit. Suppose that um, the price of your coffee changed there and then you want to go and update all the all the orders that have coffee on it uh, to, you know, update the price on those order lines, you know, if they haven't been finalized or, or so, something like that. I mean, these are real world application things that I see customers, you know, have to do full stack solutions for. Um, can you do that sort of thing in a low code? Yeah, that's uh, not a tall order to ask. And I think we see a lot of those uh, business requirements in, in many projects like these. Um, why don't we try that, um, you know, given, what you just suggested, maybe we could try updating um, one of the prices on a particular product. And, you know, maybe we can find all orders that, uh, you know, are matching or have that as part of the order line and, and update all of the different, different orders. Um, so in order to do that, we'll start at the, you know, I have a products screen here that, that has multiple products. So, we have to first add some kind of event handle handler um, to pick up when the unit price gets changed. Um, in order to do that, let's jump to that particular table. That's the products table here. Now in this platform, we have events and here we have several, but the one I'm looking at is an, is an on after record update. So after, um, you've changed the pricing, you might wanna handle or do something. Let's make that happen. So here I've added uh, another function and you can see that it's uh, got me some stub. And now let me write a little bit of code here. So in this case, we can use um, one of the business objects available to us. And let's get to that first. Found an updater. And given that we know the record and we know that there is a relationship from products to, to order detail, we can set up this uh, variable and we can also run a little, um, little writing uh, written script to set the column values. So in this case, I wanna update the unit price and I want it to match um, the unit price that was just changed um, on this particular product. 
So what I'm doing here now is I'm doing an update, running an update in the background on all orders um, that match that particular product. Okay, I, so I, I, I think I understand that this happens after the record's been updated, you get the record passed in, and then you do this cascading action on all the order lines that have that product on it. Um, maybe, uh, what if the, what if, you know, there, you have order lines on orders that have already been shipped or submitted or posted or whatever, you know, hypothetical sure. scenario. So you, do you, do you so have you more control filter. over that or is this just like a, a blanket thing that would- Yeah, work? yeah, we have, a, we have full control. So maybe we want to filter um, the list of orders to just certain, so just certain matching items. Um, one way to do that is by um, running a filtered search prior to our update action down here. So maybe we want to look at products, um, products that have not yet shipped, right? Um, so products to order details, and we can look at orders that have a ship date um, that's you know null, right? Uh, so then that indicates that the order has not yet shipped and not yet finalized. So if I were to do something like this, um, this would put us in a filtered state and then the update would apply only to those particular orders. Okay, so that's like a, a some shorthand API to, to quickly look for um, null order. So then you go one table over from the order detail to the joined orders. And then that, I guess that caret symbol is, is that it's a null. That's right. And then so you filtered that and then so your updater only works on the on the uh, the subset that you filtered for. Yep. And this and this all happened. And so, do you mind showing me the? I think it was on your table. You had like a list of events. Was it the table? Yeah. Let's go back to that. Um, so these are all events related to like the the entity or the data model itself. Not the, and this is not a UI thing like when we saw double click or on show. So you yes. have events, you have events that like in the UI and events around data, the data model itself. Correct. They are, you know, separate. Um, exactly. So as this is happening in the background, the UI, you know, hasn't, you know, doesn't play a part in it. So really, if you had programmed it, uh, programmatically updated a particular unit price, it would also execute this event as well, whether or not it came from the UI or user or some background process or flow would also hit the same event hook. Okay, can you show me if it works? Absolutely, let's take a look. Okay, let's first find a product. Um, I think coffee is a good one. And currently it's at $46, right? So if we were to lower this down to $30, this should affect any orders that are open. So let's see if there's any that are open with coffee. And the ship date has to be empty. So there's one record that hasn't shipped yet. And if we open that record, we can see that the coffee price does did indeed go down to 30 bucks. Wow, okay, I'm convinced. Okay, well, that um, you've got me. Uh, you showed that uh, you have um, able to handle more uh, complexity at the, you know, at the data level as well, and and real business logic. Thanks for that, Duan. All right. We've discussed a lot of functional requirements for complex applications and seen how it's possible for the right kind of low code to address this. For enterprise class applications and commercial software vendors in particular, there's a whole host of so-called non-functional requirements which must be addressed if you're going to try low code. Most notable, software vendors often deliver multi-tenant applications on-premise in the cloud across different countries, locales, and in multiple languages. 
and they expect to deliver to browsers, desktops, and mobile devices seamlessly. This includes interactions with devices and local custom hardware integrations. In conclusion, we've discussed and seen that it is possible for locos to address the need of complex applications, but it is absolutely necessary to qualify the platform and make sure that it can deliver what's needed for UX freedom, robust logic, deep integration, and ISV or enterprise features. I'd like to thank my colleague for the demos and thank you for your time.